This is Dave Neesmith from Bats and Mice and Sleepy Time Trio, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And on the show this week, we have returning guest Matt Pryor of the Get Up Kids. Matt's new memoir, Red Letter Days, comes out January 23rd via Washed Up Books. And we cover that book. We cover a lot of Get Up Kids history. Look, there's a lot I learned about Matt that I didn't know. There's some new questions about the Get Up Kids that we didn't cover last time. It's a great conversation, and that's coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Reviews. We need Apple Podcast Reviews. We currently sit at 175. We have to get over 200. We have to. We only need 25 more. Open up your podcast application, search the new scene, scroll down, hit that five-star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it at the end of the show. Shirts. The new scene has shirts available for sale at Death Wish Inc. We've got a long sleeve option. We've got short sleeve options. Pick one up. It's a great way to support the show. And you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Iodine Recordings welcomes Unsufferable to the label. This is a new band featuring Rob Fish of 108, Dave Bushmeyer of Omen Astra and New Day Rising, and Ryan McInturf of The Fault of Man and Bludgeon. The debut EP will be out soon, so keep an eye out for that. There's a new short film from Judas Knife, directed by Nathaniel Shannon. It's called Milk and Shadow and it's available now on the Iodine YouTube page. The soundtrack is available via Ashtray Monument Records, and it's limited to 100 copies, so get one soon. No Man has some gigs coming up with Strike Anywhere. One is May 3rd at Richmond Music Hall in Richmond, Virginia, and one is May 4th at St. Vitus in Brooklyn. One Line Drawing will be playing ZBR Fest this May in Chicago, Jerome's Dream have East Coast tour dates in February. And finally, Bucket Full of Teeth, the discography, is up now and available for streaming. And you can get the vinyl from Iodine Recordings. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, Death Wish Inc. That's right, Death Wish Inc. is sponsoring the new scene for the month of January. And here's an update. Gouge Away's new album called Deep Sage will hit stores on March 15th. Listen to their new song, Stuck in a Dream. It's on all the streaming platforms. You can pre-order the record now at gougeaway.com. And look, don't forget to support Death Wish Inc. They've got an incredible roster of bands. They've got storefronts for everybody. You can follow them on Instagram at Death Wish Inc. Or check out their website, at deathwishinc.com. Okay, so listen, check back in with me in segment three. We've got some new reviews and listener feedback. I'll read those. I saw All Else Failed this past Saturday at St. Vitus. I'll talk about that. There's a lot to discuss. There's a lot to catch up with. But first, we are going to speak to Matt Pryor of the Get Up Kids. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Matt Pryor. Matt, welcome back to the show. I thank you for having me. Yes, Matt. It's great to have you here. A lot has happened since the last time I spoke to you. That was like... When was that? That was over two... That was June of 21. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The world was just opening back up. We were still uh, recovering from COVID. I think I might still be covering from COVID. Not the virus, but like, you know, lockdown and all that stuff. Yeah. But- it's it was a thing that was right before uh delta hit too and it was like we went out it was like the 
they opened up venues again that May and then like everybody scrambled to go back out on the road. And so everybody was on tour and then Delta hit and it was like half the people at the show were in masks. So they had that thing where people weren't, they just weren't going to shows. They were like buying tickets for shows in May and then like 30% of the audience just wasn't showing up. They weren't asking for a refund or anything. They just weren't showing up. Right. And then that was happening to bands. Yeah. Someone on, uh, someone in the band would get it, and everyone would have to test every day. It was it was a mess. Well, and you you heard rumors that some tours, you know, had COVID in them, and they just kept going. But I don't think anybody ever proved that. It wasn't anybody on our end. So I've heard rumors. All right, I've heard rumors, and these are just rumors. The move is, you just play the shows and you don't test. But you didn't hear that here. No, I mean, it's like smoking on an airplane. No one talks about it, but <laughs> people do it. <laughs> All the time. Well, Matt, there's a lot going on with you. You have a very storied history with the Get Up Kids, and we have Red Letter Days coming up, your memoir, and we're very excited about that. And I'm going to talk about all of that and even more. But first, I want to ask you, hmm. how are you doing today? Today, I'm okay. I just got back from walking the dogs and I'm talking to you. It's a pretty dreary December day in Kansas. Um, it kind of gets cold enough here to be shitty and never snows. So it's just sort of dreary out. It's like cold Seattle. And, you know, so I'm going to make some soup for dinner as soon as I get off the, the phone, <laughs> get off the phone, get off the, <laughs> the call with you. <laughs> it's a landline we're doing this over. We're on the we're on a dial up landline right now with yeah. the rotary thing. It's, it's actually it's, a, it's a party line, so someone else might join in. You never know. Well, that's good. I'm 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 glad you're here. Do you still enjoy cooking? Is that still an interest of yours? Oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. Uh, I I'm, I cook dinner every night for um, both my wife and daughter have been under the weather, both negative for COVID, bringing it back around. But uh, so I'm making soup. So that's what we do. What kind of soup? Today, well, I had been basically just giving them chicken ramen. I make my own chicken. Like, well, it's kind of a multi, multi animal broth. And then uh, making them some ramen. And tonight we're making potato soup just for variety's sake. Nice. I don't cook that often, but a few years ago I made a homemade chicken noodle soup. And mm -hmm. I have to say, pretty good. Yeah. It's it's a reason. It's a classic. It's a classic for a reason. I said that the wrong order. So your daughter's got to be about 21 now. She's living at home? Uh, yeah, for the time being, yes. And your two sons, what are they up to these days? Uh, 16 and 19, and they both live at home as well. So we're we're all crammed in here, but it's cozy. Are you still living in Lawrence? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Nice. So you have a memoir coming out. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's called It's called Red Letter Days. It's funny to call it a memoir. It's one of those things that you have to get used to. I haven't fully gotten used to it yet. Is it a memoir? Do you call it that? I call it a book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it, mainly because memoir sounds sort of pretentious if I say that about myself. It's kind of like, it's only in the last, I don't know, five, 10 years that I've been comfortable and I'm still not entirely referring to myself as an artist, quote unquote. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, no, I'm just, I'm just in a band. I'm just, I'm just. We just play shows, you know, and then like the 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 language has to change as you get more quote unquote professional. So my thing now is I can say I'm an author, which is kind of a new a new wrinkle. It makes me sound a little bit more uh, prestigious when I'm talking to my wife's getting her PhD right now. So whenever I talk to people in her circle, I can say, well, I'm actually a published author. Yeah, that's good. Are you going to get one of those jackets with the uh, the tweed patches on the elbows, maybe a pipe or something? Oh, that would be sweet. Yeah, you you got to really lean into this thing. Yeah, I really should. Well, Red Later Days, your first book yeah. is coming. Mm -hmm. We And that's coming out January 23rd. So we're excited about that. And uh, I have read the book, Matt. Oh, okay. And I have an advance of it because I'm so uh, dug in to the industry that... Uh, that I get a sneak preview of these things, and I, I love, I love the book. And uh, to everybody out there listening, I recommend the book to you. Because, I mean, if you have an interest in this era of shows, and especially if you have an interest in the Get Up Kids, there's there's a lot of great stuff in here. So, Matt, when did you conceive the idea of the book? When when did you start working on it? Uh, 
let's see. I think I, I started kicking around the idea of it when I was still doing uh, my own podcasting of just like, you know, all the, all the chapters in the book are just store like very like extended versions of stories that I've told about my life. And, um, so I kind of always had this idea in the back of my head of like, this would make a cool book, just having these, these stories. And, uh, it was a uh, Frank Turner actually who uh, has written two books, I believe. Who was just like, "All right, you got to write a thousand words a day," and I was like, "Okay, I can do that." And so I just set out to write a thousand words a day. And sometimes I would write more, and it just it took you know uh, a couple months to do it, and then I sat on it for a year because <laughs> I was scared. Yeah, I can imagine because there's a. There's a lot of intimate stuff in here. Well, and it's also just kind of like it's like uh, you know, there's a there's a grace period between when you finish a project, whether it's a record or or anything, before the public sees it, and it's just long enough for you to start doubting yourself and kind of going like, ah, oh, this sucks. And then it was this thing of like, okay, now I have to go out and like with no like I I have a foot in the door in the music industry. I have no no feet in anywhere in the publishing industry. So it was like going out and like kind of like cold calling and like trying to find someone to put it out. And, uh, that was that, you know, there was some rejection involved there. And so then you get into this, like, Oh, this is stupid. Who wants to read what I, you know, it's the same thing I thought about when I made a rec when I've made records, same thing I thought about when I made a podcast and ultimately you come to the same conclusion. It's just like, fuck it. I like it. So we'll just, we'll just do it. And if nobody likes it, that's fine. There's plenty of other media in the world. Right. How do you handle rejection? Now, you know, I, I'm in a position where I'm putting some new music out there and I'm seeing if there's any interest and I've realized that I don't handle it very well. How do you handle it? Uh, it depends on the rejection. Uh, if it's if it's something like, you know, I, I am guilty of that, you know, you you post something on your socials and then it's like positive, 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 one shitty guy. And then that's all you can look at is like, just go like, wow, I'm going to tell him, you know, and, but then I have to like remind myself that that's stupid and that doesn't make, it's not going to change anything. Uh, if someone, if someone doesn't like what I, let me, refer, let me figure this out. If someone is just blanketly like saying this is shit without really giving it a chance, which has happened to me before um, with get up kids and with my own, stuff outside of the band i don't really take it that seriously i tend to get kind of like a punk rock like fuck you kind of attitude about it yeah uh if someone is very articulate and can like break it down and be like this is what i don't like about it and this is why and then i can I, that doesn't bother me at all actually that that makes me just kind of go like oh okay i respect that it's the it's the flippant ones that sort of get under my craw that i'm i'm kind of worried you know working on of just, you know, for my own uh, mental health of just kind of like, you suck, you know, it's just like, well, all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, it, it really depends on the context and the situation and everything else. But typically if someone is saying you suck, there's someone who's not actually making anything. And I think right. those are easy. Those are easier to take. Well, and then it's like, so this happened the other day. We, we were playing, uh, get up kids were opening for Manchester Orchestra in Atlanta last mm. last month this month actually it was only two weeks ago and i was told this was the most quote-unquote prior thing i've ever done and uh <laughs> that somebody in the crowd was just going like after every song was going good job dad and like like that and i was just like <laughs> what and he's like good job dad and i'm like did you just call me dad and they're like yeah dad and i just went get fucked dude and like just said that into the microphone and everybody laughed and we started the next song, but it was just sort of like, that's just asinine hecklers. I have no time for hecklers. I'll, I'll just destroy. I'm not like stand up comedian good, but I've, I've dealt with enough of them that I can, I can tear them down. You, you strike me as someone who could take down a heckler pretty quickly. Um, well, not to toot my own horn, but don't fuck with me. <laughs> Why, why I have why? a microphone. I'm much louder than you. <laughs> why good job, dad? What, I wonder what he was trying to accomplish with I that comment. Know. There was some, there was a show in Italy one time where people threw lemons at us and they were like, why are you throwing lemons at us? Like, they must hate us. And like, no, that means we like you. And I was like, what? And then they kept going, Bob, blah, blah, like from Arrested Development. 
Yeah. And I was like, I don't understand. What? And they just kept doing it. And I was just like, it's just there. Sometimes, you know, like it's that thing of like, you know, you and your friends have some sort of common, weird, common, like language that only you guys understand, like in oh, high yeah. school or whatever. And it just that sometimes that gets presented to me and I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So I, I don't, just got to move on. Yeah. I don't take it personally. I ask them to explain it and they usually don't. So in this book, Red Letter Days, I mean, there's a lot of detail about shows and tours and different things that happen. What did you pull from? Was it just memory or I, I saw at one point that you pulled from journal entries. Did you keep journals while you were out there touring and doing all this stuff? Um, well, so that's a bit of a, that's that's in like the, the press release, but it's kind of a misnomer. It's not really from journals. It's more from just uh, telling stories of things that have happened because I don't write well on the road, whether it's songwriting or journaling or or I guess book writing now um it, so it's it's been mostly like things that are like in the way that like say a stand-up comedian will like hone a story on stage by telling it over and over again yeah kind of like that but it instead of being on stage and telling the story it's like backstage at a party on my porch at a bar something like that so it was a lot of uh a lot of just recounting and then and fine-tuning those sort of stories that I've told a thousand times. I got you. Yeah. And when I read it, I was thinking in terms of a podcast because I was like, wow, this this is what you want from a podcast that, you know, this is just chock full of good stories and you can really dig in because we really have the time to sit down and write and for us to read it. Oh, nice. I'm glad that was kind of the idea. So I'm, I'm glad that you feel that way. Yeah. So I didn't know, I learned this from the book that you're diabetic. Mm-hmm. And you got diagnosed in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Tell the story of the diagnosis because it's pretty incredible. And I'm surprised that you survived that. <laughs> uh, when I was in sixth grade, I got really sick and didn't know why. And I just felt horrible pain in my stomach and I had to pee all the time. And uh, I was vomiting and then it eventually got to the point where I was hallucinating and I fell down the stairs at my townhouse. It was right after my parents had gotten divorced too, which I don't remember if I said that in the book or not. But uh, the so I was living with my mom and my brother in a townhouse, and I fell down the stairs, and so she called the ambulance. And my blood sugar was, which is you know the the thing you regulate when you're diabetic, because I didn't know I was I was diabetic at the time, but I didn't know it was just through the roof enough to uh, like you're re a person who's not diabetic, their blood sugar, unless you go on like a cookie bender was like between 80 and a hundred, 80 and 120. Mine was like over 900. And so I, you know, went into a coma and I, a diabetic coma is what it's called. And I don't know for how long no one, I can't imagine it was that long because no one, I wasn't out for like days and days or anything. It must've been like, a shorter period of time than that because no one's really seen. I'm sure I could look up the medical records to find out how long I was out, but I don't really want to. And, you know, then when I woke up, I had heart monitors on me and I learned that I had to, you know, take, stick needles in my stomach for the rest of my life, <laughs> you know, every time I wanted to eat. And, uh, you know, in getting diagnosed with that, when you're a teenager, you, especially like kind of an angry budding punk rock teenager it, it becomes very like you know this is my thing no one's going to tell me what to do i don't need anybody's help kind of thing and so when i started touring it's not something that i advertised you know like i've been on tour with people for weeks at a time who did not know i was diabetic even though i was taking shots every time i ate you know the big the only thing that's like really a giveaway if i don't have a low blood sugar reaction is I keep uh, either a Coca-Cola, a full sugar Coca-Cola or like a bottle of juice on stage. Mm -hmm. Like it's part of my sort of like, it's in our rider that just, it's just like one 20 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola. And it's just in case my blood sugar tanks during the set that I can just slam that. But and it's awful because you're just slamming carbonated, you know, liquid and then trying to sing. So it's just like burp factory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, but yeah, so it's it's you know it's been an interesting uh, you know I I've been all over the world carting syringes around with me, and uh, 
I thought that was an interesting kind of like, you know, not your average tour story. I mean, people probably cart syringes around, but for different reasons. Oh, yeah. 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 That's the part that's really struck me was, uh, you know, you're in venues all over the world uh, shooting yourself up. But mm-hmm. for you, for you, it's to live. Yeah. <laughs> now, this part of the book really struck me because my older brother was a uh, type 1 diabetic. He mm. was diagnosed when he was six and he succumbed to the disease at age 17. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was a a huge blow to our family. And you even mentioned in the book, uh, you know, the rare person like Julia Roberts' character in Steel Magnolias will have seizures, right? I don't know. I don't know how rare it is. It just doesn't happen to me. So I yeah, like well, that it's just so weird that you mentioned that because I remember my mom used to watch that movie over and over and over again, even before my brother passed, because I guess she felt some connection with it you know mom looking out for diabetic kid and, right and they would always have like orange juice on hand uh in case he dipped and had a seizure so it was uh oh he actually had seizures okay yes yes that's what uh, that's what ultimately took him out and the thirst that you mentioned in the book you mentioned that uh it was just this unbelievable unsatiable thirst and you mm-hmm. bought like you bought 10 sodas and <laughs> yeah mixed them all in one pitcher and downed it like uh-huh. Full sugar sodas, yeah, yeah. That's that's wild, and I because I just remember when my brother got diagnosed, we were on the boardwalk in Jersey, and he just kept saying, "I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty," and and they would just keep buying him sodas, and and the thirst just would not go away. So it was uh, it was pretty trippy to read you going through all of those things as well. Yeah, I think that was they used to say, and I don't know if they still do that. That was always a like a warning sign for type one is if you your kid was drinking excessively and and having to pee all the time. I wonder if it's a little bit different now that full sugar sodas are more out of fashion for younger people, you know, like it would, you would be drinking more water and you wouldn't be like, you know, I was drinking, you know, Welch's grape soda and like kicking my blood sugar through the roof because, you know, that was what we drank in, you know, 1990. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah. instead of water. Remember growing up, like we didn't drink water. We drank iced tea that my mom made at home that she dumped a lot of sugar in. We drank uh-huh. soda. We drank fruit punch. Like Kool-Aid. we didn't get a, gl- yeah, we didn't get a glass of water. No. We just drank and it, sugar drinks. And like bottled water was considered like really, you know, either fancy or effeminate <laughs> or like yeah. pretentious, like LA, like you know, or Miami Vice kind of, uh, you know what I was like? It was like a very like, oh, that's what they do in, in places like that. Like eating sushi, yeah. eating sushi was the same way, but. Yeah. Bottled oh, water didn't exist as far as I was concerned. It existed. It just was mostly in Europe. Yeah. But yeah. So I, I just wonder if people, cause they used to call it juvenile diabetes type one, cause it was only kids that got it. And then right. that's changed. But uh, yeah, I do wonder if it would, if it just like, if there's some, uh, if the warning signs are different now that, that, you know, full sugar sodas aren't as in fashion. How do you, uh, maintain insulin on tour? Because you had it before the pumps and all the self-regulating stuff. So when I first started touring, I had, you know, just disposable syringes and two different kinds of insulin vials that I was supposed to keep refrigerated that I never really did. And then by the time we started touring in tour buses, I would keep it in the fridge on the bus. And then a couple, maybe, I don't know, I, I don't even remember at what point, it switched over to these like insulin pens where like the insulin was in, you know, the, it, you know, it looks like a, like a pen and like it had yeah. like a plunger on it and it just had a disposable needle cap. And so I would switch to that. Um, and then it's only in the last year actually that I've gotten out of pump because I was really resistant to the concept of it because it kind of freaked me out. The idea of like being on stage and like jumping around and then also singing and using your abdomen with a needle in your stomach the whole time kind of weirded me out. But I uh, eventually was convinced to try it and now I, now I love it. It must make things a lot easier, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I haven't done an international flight yet, but that was always a fun like little gang. I don't like I never liked taking shots in front of people because I thought it would weird them out. Mm-hmm. And so it would be like, 
having to time it to where you got your meal on a plane. You know, if you're like on an international flight and they bring you like, I don't know, a steamed omelet and just like having to like time when I could take my shot. And now I can just be like, beep, 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 and it'll be fine. So I, th- I'm kind of looking forward to that, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's just easier to control things, you know? It's a lot. It's, you know, what's even more than that is that I have a, a blood sugar. Um, it's called a Dexcom, which is like a sim. So one side of my stomach has one needle in it at all times. And the other side has a different one. And one checks my blood sugar and I can just check it on my phone or my watch. And yeah. that has been a game changer because I can like check my blood sugar without having to poke my finger over and over and over again. And I would only be able to do that on my right hand because my left hand would be so calloused from playing guitar that a needle wouldn't puncture my finger at all. Like it wouldn't bleed um, because the calluses were so thick. So my right hand looked like I, you know, like crazy full of holes. Yeah. I still remember the old days of the strips and you'd have those little blue uh, pin prick things and mm-hmm. you'd have to stab your finger and put it on the strip and put it in the thing. And it, it was, it was, I mean, how did you handle all of that, all of that when you were younger? Were you pretty on top of it? Like, did you, I mean, did you maintain it? Okay. Uh, I mean, I did all the things, but I didn't really, uh, you know, I was a very defiant young person. So I was very like, I was, my blood sugars were kind of all over the map because I would just kind of eat whatever I wanted to and then not really take that into consideration. And then, you know, they <clears throat> call it chasing where it's just like you eat something and then your blood sugar spikes. And so you have to take more insulin. And then sometimes you overcalculate that and then your blood sugar gets low and then you have to eat something and then you maybe overeat when you're trying to correct that. And then you have to chase it again. And it's just, it's just a nightmare. It's just way easier to like eat um, a lower carb diet and not have to take as much insulin. So you don't have to correct it as much. So it's got to be a lot easier to maintain right now, right? I mean, compared to back then. Is it it kind of second nature or is it still like, oh, I have to do all this stuff? I mean, it's second nature for sure. Like I I don't even like think about it anymore. I mean, I think about it when I have to, like right now I need to, I do, after we're done, I need to change my pump before dinner. I have to change it every three days. And so I'll have to do that, but it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. It just takes like a couple minutes. So you had a really interesting upbringing as well. Uh, you know, not too dissimilar from my own. You went to Catholic school, right? Mm-hmm. That was a lot of fun, I bet, huh? Nope. <laughs> I really disliked it because it was uh, it was like the beginning of introduction to me of like how unfair life is. You have <laughs> like, you just have the rich kids up here and they're really nasty and mean to everyone. Um, but they get all the breaks and then you have the rest of us down here. And, uh, yeah, I would say overall, just a, a very not positive experience for me. How about for you? Yeah, I think at the time, I don't think it was as much of a, of a socioeconomic thing because I actually came from a pretty upper middle class background. So it wasn't like the rich kids and the poor kids. It was more like the jocks and the weirdos. Like it was more of a breakfast club kind of vibe. But then it was like, what really got me was a sort of like, hmm, kind of like intellectual fascism of the whole, of the whole thing, because it wasn't a very positive environment as far as like questioning faith or the Bible or anything like that. It was just kind of, it was kind of a like, just shut up and do what you're told sort of vibe. And that just didn't, didn't work for me, you know? Yeah. Same here. And yeah, it, w- it was still uh, jocks versus everyone uh, when I was growing up too. But when I look back, uh, a lot of the jocks were rich kids. So Right. I just can't say that because I was I was technically more, I wasn't a rich kid, but I, I definitely came from a decent, I had a decent upbringing financially. So I understand. Look, we're going to let that slide. We're going to forget about that. <laughs> <laughs> If there's one thing I know about punk rock and hardcore, a lot a lot of those kids come from money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people you don't expect to. Mm-hmm. The, the key is to check their parents' name on Wikipedia. And if their name is a link in blue, you know, <laughs> then you know. Then you know. So, uh, your parents divorced when you were young. And in the book, you said your dad moved to the East Coast. Did you, uh, did you, do you keep in touch with him? Have you kept up with him over the years? 
Yeah, I mean, we're not close, but he he lives in Boston now, and you know, I uh, I'll probably talk to him on Christmas, see him a couple times a year. Um, he used to come see us play more often. He doesn't really anymore. He's getting kind of up. It's just it's too late in the day for him. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's around. But just he's he's always been kind of a distant. He's not a big talker, which is ironic since he's a lawyer. But it, um, you know, he, he, you know, it's it's fine. It seemed like the divorce was pretty hard on you as a kid. You you mentioned uh, you had a lot of anger in the book. Was it because of the divorce or just general being young anger or both? I mean, it was a lot of things. It was the diabetes. It was the divorce. It was the Catholic school, and then discovering heavy metal and ultimately punk rock, and just how that gives you an outlet to to express that anger. It's you know and of the of all of those things, probably the Catholic school is the thing that pissed me off the most. I mean, the diabetes thing pissed me off, but there's nothing I could do about it. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas Catholic school was just kind of like, why can't you guys be less assholes? You know? <laughs> just <laughs> Right. The Get Up Kids. This is your band. I'm in it, yeah. You are in this band. Mm-hmm. All right. So in the book, Nathan, your friend, the drummer... Mm-hmm. who introduces you to Lifetime in a Veil. Mm-hmm. He said this, which I agreed with. It's better to be see a bad band play with energy than a great band just stand on stage like a tree <laughs> stump. <laughs> so the mission statement for the Get Up Kids is that you would try to become a great band that plays with energy, a pop group that isn't afraid of onstage chaos, yes? Yeah, I mean, that's a retrofitted... Like, we didn't, like, write that down as a manifesto or anything at the time, but it's it's definitely, like... It was sort of a, you know, we were, we never considered ourselves a hardcore band at all. Like that wasn't really our scene, but we learned from that scene as far as the like onstage energy goes, you know, more than like we did from like indie rock bands that we were into. Like, you know, I mean, the first Weezer record was a huge influence on us, but like watching them play live, they didn't, they just stood there, you know? And so uh, they sounded great. And, you know, as you get older, you kind of realize that there's a, a a beauty in that too. But it was like, that wasn't what we were going for. I don't know, man. I don't know if I totally agree with the whole, because I mean, a be- as a songwriter, I tend to kind of go like, you know, a good guitar solo is not going to save a bad song. A good live show is not going to save a bad song either. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it just sort of, like, I tend to be like, you know, and, but, you know, at the same time, sometimes if you're going to see a, a punk band, like, look at Turnstile. Like, whether you like them or not, like, they put on a great performance, you know? And I think it's resonating. It, you know, it's one of the reasons that they're they're blowing up as, or they have blown up as much as they have, because they're a great live band. Yeah, I think you have to dial in the, the right amount of elements for your specific band. Like, the first band I was in, we were so preoccupied with going nuts on stage to, like, have it be this big exp- experience that I think it was too much. Uh, you don't want to do that. And you don't want to just stand there too much. You got to like figure out what you're doing and dial it into these specific amounts. Well, it was, I was lucky that in high school, before I was in the Get Up Kids, I was in a, a, just a straight up noise rock band that was really more about energy than, you know, technicality at all or song structure or anything like that. And so it was kind of like, yeah, I got a little bit of that out of my system as far as like putting that particular value higher than the song craft. You know what I mean? Like as a younger person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess when you're younger, you just want to go crazy and have it be a good time. But then as you get older and more experienced, you start thinking about song structure or, uh, you know, actually playing the songs in a way everyone can enjoy. Well, and then you get older and things break easier. Your back hurts more. Your neck hurts more. You know that too. Like I'm, <laughs> I, I'm never gonna jump jump off a bass drum again. I'm so af- I like so many people have cracked that you know that bone in their leg, and I'm I'm so afraid of that happening to me, or they crack their foot or something. I don't want that to happen. We were on we were playing in Barcelona. I guess this would have been 2019, and I literally just rolled on a guitar cable. Like I stepped on a guitar cable, and it rolled under my foot. And I landed full with my all my body weight on my right hip, like oh. right on the side of the stage. And then for like a year after that, I couldn't cross my legs 
at all because I, my hip hurt so bad. So I had to do like, I didn't like go to a physical therapist, but I did a lot of like stretching and yoga and stuff like that and worked with, um, Dustin, our, our keyboard player is a, a trainer. And so he, he kind of helped me work through that. But yeah, it was just sort of like, that could have taken me out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just sort of like, and all I did was roll, you know, misstep on a guitar cable. Yeah, that's the scariest thing is even if you're careful and not going completely insane, the smallest thing can happen and and then you could be in a situation like you were in. Well, it's like that thing where they say like you don't, you know, when you get older, you don't throw your back out lifting a couch. You throw your back out like reaching for the remote. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. So when Get Up Kids get started, you said there's three elements to this thing. The quiet, loud parts, the octave fog, and half time is the right time. So what's the octave fog? So octave fog is actually a term I came up with later when we were trying to relearn old songs, relearn. Um, Cause if you listen to like our first EP and our first record, Jim and I are not communicating with each other as far as who's playing the lead and who's playing the rhythm guitar in the song. We're both just kind of doing our own thing. And so if you listen to it, and it's a lot of like octave chords. We're both doing a lot of octave chords and it's just hard to follow if you're trying to like break it down. Um, and I learned when we redid that record to play it live last year, that the way it's mixed, it, you know, sometimes it's mixed where the guitars are panned. Jim's on the left and I'm on the right, except on the songs where Jim's on the right and I'm on the left. And I don't remember which is which a lot of times. And so I have to like, go back and like talk to him and be like, what were you playing here? Cause I don't remember what this is, but yeah, there's a, there's an element of like, uh, it's just, you know, when you're just playing a lot of octave chords, you, you kind of get lost in them sometimes. Um, and like four minute mile, it's like, you know, it's like a half, you know, a half step off and all of a sudden you're like, ah, like that. <laughs> So yeah. I, that's a term that I came up with later of just octave fog. And these are, again, these are not things that were like, you know, written declarations, but like we did get to a point where like we were doing this like halftime chorus or how halftime outro thing, like way too much um, because it was just sort of like, it's what worked. You know what I mean? Which is like, yeah. you can, it still works. You know, people do it all the time. It's just, <clears throat> we were getting lazy about it where it was just sort of like, we weren't, challenging ourselves at all and so um quite loud is just sort of like full-on pixies nirvana you know it's just it's dynamics and then we learned it from like boys life and giants chair and those kind of bands right you went into a lot of detail about boys life and the uh the impact they had on you in in making this band mm -hmm. they were they were a big part of they were a big help they were a big influence and they were a big help Talking about the octave fog, like when I think of coming clean, that's just that's just a lot of octaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole that makes sense. That whole records like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I learned to play guitar. Like listening to that record and Texas is the reason and stuff. Oh yeah. If you're in drop D and playing octaves, it's like it's like easy to make a really big good sound. Oh yeah, and then you can add like a uh, a whole another. You can do like a, a fifth on top of the octave if you do it in drop D. Like you can add, you can make it into this like massive chord. Oh, yeah. That you can't really do in standard tuning unless you have really long fingers. So it was really interesting to read this book. Now, last time you were on the show, mm. you know, talking about in terms of making a band successful, you said it's 10% talent and 90% hard work. And I really agree with that. And I was, you know, I was impressed reading just everything you guys did in the early days to, to make this happen, you know, uh, getting the seven inch pressed and sitting there and cutting the artwork yourselves because, uh, you know, you had to get it ready for the shows and making the stickers and calling people and booking shows. And just, I mean, like the incredible amount of work that you guys put in, uh, to get this thing going. Uh, thanks. I don't know. Was that a question? <laughs> Well, this is where I make a statement and oh, then you okay. like, and then you like say stuff in regards to that. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I've never done a podcast before, so I don't really know how the format works. Okay. The, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very like, I mean, there's two ways you can go about it. You can either sit around and wait for somebody to do the work for you, or you can do it yourself. And I have found that if I at least go out and do the work myself, initially, even if it's on a small scale, that 
if the quality of the work is worth a damn, then people will come around and eventually people will want to help you with it. Um, which is part of the reason why like the whole major label debacle was so frustrating because we were being treated like babies when it was just like, we've been touring for two years. Like look at this efficient system we have, like look at all the work that we're doing. We've already been to Europe and you're treating us like we're, you know, like a high school band or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's just, you got to make your own luck to a certain degree. I would say that like, I would amend that there is an element of luck and timing that is part of that um, success as well. Cause I think that like 97 to 2002 for us was like kind of lightning in a bottle as far as like um, what was going on in the world and, and, and the scene and, and all that kind of stuff that, you know, uh, any other year may not have we may not have been as successful as we were yeah there was a lot of uh crisscrossing of big events you know a lot of new people coming into the scene a lot of new music happening a lot of new movements happening and uh, this was talked about in the book and we mentioned this before it was funny that you guys became the safe band for all the aggressive music people as well like myself too a lot of people somehow got a copy of four minute mile and this was the uh, accepted lighter music band to all the hardcore and grindcore and all the other fans out there. Like everybody loved it. I don't. I take offense to lighter music band, but uh, well, I didn't. I didn't want to use the e word. I tried to stay away from that. But, oh no, you know. it's fine. I would just say like we we had m- more melody in our song. In our we had you know um, it it wasn't it was less about you know the aggressiveness of it and more about the melody of the song. But um, yeah. I think that like, you know, I've been thinking about this a little bit lately of just that like, I mean, I don't know why I was thinking about this, but we were never a hardcore band. Like a lot of hardcore bands got into pop music after being hardcore bands. We were a pop band that got accepted by the hardcore community. And I don't know why, I guess maybe because we were on Doghouse. I don't know. But uh, it was just sort of like all of a sudden, I I think because we weren't like our lyrics if I, I don't know who knows why anything is anything, but like we don't, we don't lyrically don't fit into a lot of the emo tropes that I think people make fun of that are kind of like the, uh, you know, my girlfriend left me kind of things. Like we would write songs about friendships and about, you know, uh, relationships that like, I think people who, I don't know, we're into hardcore could maybe relate to a little bit more than some other people. I don't know. Who knows? I'm not a music historian. I don't know. I just think about these things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to think about. Um, I think uh, particularly on Four Minute Mile, there was was some hardcore appeal. Like if if I hear a song like Washington Square Park and I picture a guy screaming over that, that could be like one of those melodic hardcore bands that I was listening to in 1999. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like the first band that I ever heard that did like screaming and singing was uh, that band Grade from mm-hmm. Toronto. Toronto. And, uh, but like that was just a, as far as like, there's there's some sc- kind of scream singing on that song, but that's just because I didn't really know how to sing yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> It's yeah. a lot of it's a lot of like when you go back and listen to like Minor Threat or Fagazi and you just kind of like oh man Ian MacKay does not have the greatest voice but he does so much with it you know or Henry Rollins like it's just sort of like um you know it's it's a similar sort of thing where I'm just like I didn't know what I was doing but I knew what I felt and so that's how that came across yeah well it worked yeah it's, yay <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know this you sang on the Colesque Led Zeppelin cover record, an immigrant song in the beginning. You're doing the yells in the bit that beginning part. Yeah, James and I are doing the ah uh, yeah, and um, we're also on uh, we're on something else. I think we're on two or three of those songs, uh, which was just like like I knew the Colesque guys, and it was just like they're doing the they're like why are they doing a Led Zeppelin record? And it's like well, they just wanted to, and like okay, and like you want to come sing like no. None of them can hit those notes. And I was just like, well, I can. So I'm just go in and do it. And I think we did on Whole Lot of Love too. Oh, yeah. In the middle of Whole Lot of Love, that 
Oh yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm no Robert Plant, but you know, I can I can sing Led Zeppelin. I can be Robert Plant in Coalesce. <laughs> it really worked. I'm 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 thinking about that record right now, and I'm like, I have to go listen to that again. They really made it there, so it's it's cool that you're on there too. Yeah, I'm pretty happy about it. Something to write home about. Mm-hmm. Now, there was a lot of interesting tidbits in the book about this record too. I did realize that you guys were talking to Sub Pop, and uh, there was the other label who wanted you to re-record. Um, Amy. Yeah, that yeah. song because they, they thought they said they thought like, oh, this is your best song, so you're going to re-record this, and they wanted to take ownership of of the merchandising, and it was just going to be a. It was less the merchandising at the time because it was before <clears throat> before labels were doing like 360 deals and stuff, but it was more that they wanted that song in particular because they just were like, that's a hit, and it's like, well, okay, well, it's a pop song, maybe. It's a hit for us, and it's a, you know it's a song that people like. But it's like that's not the only good song we've ever written. So it was kind of offensive for them to be like, you know, this is your this is. I have found that if any time anybody says that this is your one chance to do something, that they that's usually somebody you don't want to work with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you got to have more faith in me than that. For more faith in us. It was uh, it was really interesting to read about the recording of the record and time. You guys spent in LA and uh, two interesting facts about this record. One of the, uh, so you guys ended up with Vagrant, Mm -hmm. which was a smaller label at the time, but they were going to let you have an imprint and it was just going to be a better deal. But one of the business partners got a loan from his parents and they put their house up for collateral. Mm -hmm. That's one thing going on. And then they went into business with a pornographer to press CDs, some, some guy, and he, he just disappeared. So these are both things that I didn't know about at the time. I only learned about later. Um, How did you find out about it? uh, The house thing I learned about from when the magazine Punk Planet did the the sort of expose on Vagrant Records. And I was like, what? Wait, what? Really? And (laughs) the pornographer thing I learned about doing the Vagrant podcast that I did uh, a year or two ago where Rich was just telling me about that. And I was just like, I I think they intentionally, like we were just on tour. You know what I mean? Like we put a record out, we just stayed on tour. We we were literally only really concerned with that day's activity in that city. And all these other things were kind of, I don't know if they were kept from us, but uh, I was not aware that they were they were going on. And I think it might've freaked me out if I had been aware at the time. So I'm kind of glad I wasn't. Yeah, I was going to say like that that would have been insane pressure knowing that some guys poor parents their house is on the line. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you ended up playing this incredible run of shows during that time, the 65 shows in 70 days. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. That I mean, that must have been like a crazy grueling experience. But there wasn't that when your voice was like almost blown out and you had the crazy uh drunk bus driver that i mean the but i think the bus driver would have scared me more than anything else but here's the thing when you're young you're just like you just don't see as much or care as much you're just hyper focused on the thing that you're doing and you can survive like crazy bad circumstances but when i think about that bus driver now i think that would have freaked me out more than anything else well we didn't know any better you know what i mean and it was just sort of like you know when you live in a van for three years, you have a really high tolerance for squalor. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of like the idea of having my own bed. And it was just sort of like, no one knew enough to be like, this guy's a lunatic. He's going to kill us. Like we should hire, you know, we should fire him and get a new driver, which, which is a common thing that happens sometimes, you know, sometimes you get a bus driver who's a racist and you just go like, well, all right, you got to go. And, um, you know, it's just, I don't, I've never had that happen to me. That's just something I've heard before. And, uh, but we didn't know any better. You know what I mean? And the same way that like booking 65 shows in 70 days, we didn't know any better. And I was 22. So, you know, we're talking about this tour next year for something right home about 25th anniversary. And I'm like, I can't, I don't want to plan on doing more than like three or four shows in a row. Cause I don't know that I can sing that many you know, I, 
I'm 40, I'll be 47 when we do that tour. And it's just like, I don't recover the same way that I did when I was 22. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I just, I need to, to take that into consideration. I mean, there's just nothing I can do about it. It's not like my skill set has gotten worse. It's just sort of like my body is older and my vocal cords are older. <laughs> and so they don't recover as quickly. Yeah. Yeah. No, like there's a, it's, that's just the way it is. Like you're saying, there's a specific amount of time you need to take and specific things you need to do to to preserve the voice for the next show. You know what I'm really intrigued about, about that tour coming up? I read a thing about Taylor Swift training for her stadium tour that for six months, she ran on a treadmill every day and sang her whole set on the treadmill to build up stamina. And I was like, well, I don't think I need to do that for six months, but I might start doing that for like a couple of weeks before the tour starts. <laughs> That's a good idea. You're yeah. going to do it? I, I'm thinking about it. I mean, I've got a while. It's, it's not going to start till next year or so. Yeah. The, the most incredible thing is pop stars like Taylor Swift, who they have to like dance and sing the whole song if they're not lip syncing. But the mm -hmm. ones who really do those uh, extravagant dances and sing the whole set, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. You got to be, you got to, you got to have stamina, you know? Oh, yeah. Another thing you mentioned in the book, and we talked about this a little bit last time you were on the show, was some of the fights that happened. We were from Philadelphia, so we mentioned that fight that happened at First Unitarian Church a mm -hmm. while ago. But but you mentioned another fight at another show where you know something would happen where these tough guys who took over the show, it was like the same guys who called us pussies for liking the music. Yeah, that's what you said in the book. And then, but now now they like the band. So they're claiming ownership over it. So there'll be kids on stage trying to sing along and these tough guys are claiming ownership over the area and over the band and beating up kids who are trying to sing along and have fun. And you know what, that, that really spoke to me because we dealt with a lot of that in our scene when we were growing up. And it's, uh, again, hearkening back to the Catholic school days of uh, these systems where it's just unfair. It was, it was difficult to watch these things happen and there was nothing you could do about it because it was like you versus a gang. I mean, uh, how did you guys deal with that? Did you, I, I know there was times you had to stop shows, but did it go on for a long time or like what, what was, what was your experience with that? It didn't go on for a long time because once it started happening, we started recognizing it and, you know, changing the venues we were playing at kind of accordingly. I mean, part of it is like, it's a growing pains thing, right? And like, so when you are in an underground music scene and you found your people in that scene and like, it's just a special place for you and your friends. And it's, you know, it's, of course you take ownership of it. I remember feeling that way when Nirvana blew up, you know, which is like, no, 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 this is my thing. Like, you can't have this. Like, this is, you know, the guys who, you know, used to make fun of me in high school, can't have wallet chains and Doc Martens and listen to Nevermind. Like that's insane. And so I understand that feeling, but to take it out on someone smaller than you is just really, really wrong. And it's just, you know, our band got popular enough that it was starting to appeal to younger people who weren't in this quote unquote scene and they didn't know the quote unquote rules of it. And, you know, uh, so they would come to shows and just think it was just a regular like pop concert. And, you know, it's sort of like if a, if a band outgrows the scene that you're in, it's, there's nothing you can do about it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just sort yeah. of like, it's like you have to, the best possible scenario is you can be like, well, good for them because they worked really hard for it and they deserve their success. Right. Yeah. But then there's a part of you that's just like, I don't like, I don't want to go to a whatever show. Like, you know, like I'm trying to think of an example. Um, but it's just like, you know, I, I'll listen to the music, but just like, you know, I don't know. It was just, it was just frustrating because it was like, we're not a political band. We're not an aggressive band. And to, so then to have people sort of like misrepresenting, um, us really and our music was really frustrating and so you know we're we we've always thought of ourselves as a you know we're in a, uh, somewhere between an, a party and an escape you know or both you know what i mean like which is sort of like we don't we don't want anyone to feel like you want, want to forget about shit for an hour while you're at a get a kid show and 
you know, this was just people like not allowing that to happen. So we tried outsmarting them by like going like, okay, we're going to play nothing but ballads, but then they didn't work. And then ultimately we just had to start, you know, that was the moment, especially in Philadelphia where we had to start playing places that had actual security because we wanted everybody to have a good time, not just the hardcore kids. We wanted the hardcore kids to have a good time too, but they were, you know. You couldn't. There was a while where you couldn't. And I, I would get nervous when certain people locked onto certain bands because I was like, well, somebody's going to get beaten up or I'm going to get kicked across the room or, it, you know, it's going to be a bad time. But Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah. Thankfully, a lot of that has uh, died down because I still go to a good number of shows and I don't, I don't really see much of that anymore. That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah, it was very. It was a very toxic sort of vibe, you know. And it was sort of like, I also kind of wonder because I've been making this sort of parallel lately after watching that Woodstock documentary with like, what was it, Woodstock '99? Yeah, and about how, and then also this whole joke about how like we couldn't get on the radio because you know new metal was all the rage, and how there was like all this like anger like pent up, um, and it was like you know. A, in in hardcore, you know, hardcore and new metal are not that far apart as far as like loud, chunky, angry, you know, vibe. I mean, the 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 vocals are significantly different, but it's just um. So it's just like this sort of like anger that was coming out, and that's not really what we do. You know what I mean? We weren't yeah. an angry band. We were we were lyrically upset about stuff, <laughs> but not angry about it. Certainly not an angry band. There, There is a lot of parallels, especially between hardcore and new metal at that time, because a lot of the bands I listened to, when older guys heard it, they would just call it new metal. So mm. to, to them, it was probably just more new metal. But I was like, no, man, this is like disembodied. This right. is right, good right, shit. Right. Yeah. So when you got into more Americana music, mm-hmm. you mentioned in the book, you were struck by the poetic quality of it and how powerful it can be while being quiet. You know, it doesn't need to be all riffs. It, it, it You can just say less and do less and it can have the same effect. You decided to go in this direction with the Get Up Kids. And I've been curious. Well, I didn't. The band you didn't. Did. No, I mean, the band. I already had an outlet for that. The band was going in that direction in general. That was going to be my question. Like, did you present it to the band or did no. the band just... Dis- no. So the band decided collectively... This is the direction we want to go in. Yeah. And I mean, the best example of that, I mean, the band was was getting into different music and getting into more classic rock and, you know, discovering, as an adult, discovering the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and and, and all that, and the kinks and all that kind of stuff. And then um, also just kind of getting sick of the scene of just like, it felt like the scene that we were in, a lot of the bands were starting to sound alike and a lot of the the it just wasn't really working for us anymore and we wanted to try other stuff and we were getting into this other stuff anyway i was the only one who really got deep into like singer songwriters uh everybody else kind of got more into like 60s and 70s kind of rock and but you know the kind of perfect example of it is that like a song like overdue was a was supposed to be a new amsterdam song and it ended up just being like, oh, this is a good song. We should have it be a Get Up Kid song. And, you know, if we were making something to write home about, we wouldn't, we would have been like, well, no, that doesn't work. But because of what we were, we were doing, then the lines got a little bit more blurry at that point. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, I only like acoustic guitars now. So now my band has to have acoustic, you know what I mean? It was just like, <laughs> it was just yeah. sort of like, I got into this thing. I got into singer songwriters and you know, parallel to that, the rest of the band got into more like rock and roll and less into like punk and hardcore. Um, And, you know, those two things, you know, ultimately ended up making on a wire, which will be in my next book. (laughs) Yes. Yes. The book has been left open for a sequel. And you know what? I'm looking forward to reading more, but we'll get there. We'll get there. So it sounded like, it sounds like everybody was on to different stuff, right? And it worked together well enough that we could make on a wire and try out something different. And yes, you mentioned that uh, a lot of bands were sounding like the same pool of influences that you were pulling from previously and that the industry had its claws and everything and and you had no interest in that. So could you see that at the time and you just wanted no part of that? 
I mean, it wasn't like a, you know, uh, again, it wasn't like a, a, a line in the sand or anything. It was just sort of like, even before you like put the industry stuff into it at all, it was just sort of like, well, this is kind of where, what we're getting into, you know, this sort of different, you, you know, and it, it, it's hard to explain because like hardcore was never really part of our thing at all. It was more, you know, indie rock and it was, you know, the bands that we can all agree on are like Fagazi, Super Chunk, Drive Like Jehu, you know, stuff like that, which are all bands that kind of have evolved. I mean, Jehu only put out two records, but like Fagazi evolved a lot over the years. And it was just sort of like not being afraid to do that um, and to try something different. And then also just, you know, I mean, at that time we were, and this is, I don't know if we've said this enough, but we we are aware of it that we were the band had been successful for like five years at that point, and I think we were probably so far up our own asses that we thought we could do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when if you you can get mad at like, well, Vagrant should have told us that like we were making a mistake. It's like, well, well then we would have left them and fired. Them. You know what I mean? Like we would have we we were just kind of like we've always done what we like, and that's worked so far. So we like this now. So therefore, everyone else by the transitive property should like this as well. And that didn't prove to be the case. Right. Well, that, I mean, you have to do what's in your heart, right? Yeah. I mean, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And then also, you know, I'd rather take the lumps and do things that make me happy. Exactly. So when Guild Show comes out, the band returned to more of its earlier sound, more of a rock sound. Uh, how was the band at that time? And how was the reception from fans at that time? I know you guys ended up breaking up like a year a year later, but like when the album comes out and, and you're touring on that album, like how are things? Oh, internally they were terrible. But uh, that record never really got a chance to get off the ground because I quit the band before it really had a chance to, to breathe. Uh, I don't know. I think kind of similar to our last record problems. I think if people who liked our earlier records would give it a chance, they would like it, but you can't necessarily, you know, teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, it's hard for me to listen to, you know, a band who I love's new record from time to time as well. And so I understand it, but it, you know, at during hindsight being 2020, we probably should have taken some time off after wire to like, you know, live life and like collect our heads and, and, you know, uh, just get out of the rat race that we had been in for 10 years. And so, uh, but we didn't know that we were children, <laughs> you know, we're just, even then we are like 23, 24 and it's just like, we don't know anything. Yeah. It's pretty incredible that you were that young and you're, you know, dealing with record labels and it sounds like doing some managing of the band and, and just out on the road so much. I mean, uh, it's impressive. When I was 23 years old, I, I was just trying to get as drunk as I could and do as many drugs as I could. Well, I mean, that's, that's one way to go about it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know, man. I just, I wanted to get out so bad. You know, I just wanted to leave and go on tour. And so we made it happen and then it started working. And then it was just kind of like, you just got to stay on the roller coaster. You know what I mean? It just so happened that you did that and it kept going for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Still going. Yeah. So what happened? You quit the band? I quit the band, yeah. When? How does that happen? Uh, I was miserable and... I ultimately said I needed to take a break and they said either we do it hundred percent or we don't do it at all. And I said, then I don't want to do it at all. Cause it's just this stupid, you know, what it, what should have happened is we should have taken a couple of years off and that's it. But yeah, because you know, when you're 20, when you're a young person, it's like everything is, the, everything is the most important thing in the world. And so that's, that's how that happened. Were you on tour or were you guys home? We were in Australia. You were in Australia? Mm-hmm. We were on a tour with Saves the Day where we played in Japan and Australia. And on the flight from Tokyo to Sydney, we had a layover in Singapore, 
maybe. I don't remember where. It was one of those like massive airports that's like an entire city. And, you know, Ryan called me aside and could tell I was unhappy. And then we had a band meeting in uh, in Australia. And I was, that was it. So then we had to play the rest of the tour in Australia. And then we went on a seven-week tour opening for Dashboard Confessional that was fucking miserable. Not because of Dashboard, but because we hated each other. <laughs> so you quit the band, but you continued touring for all of those weeks. Yeah. I mean, we needed the money and it, the tour was already on sale and I didn't want to piss anybody else off. And, you know, it's just like, I'll just put up with it. And you were incredibly far from home. That must have been very stressful. Uh, I was even more stressful because my wife was mm, seven months pregnant with our second kid. So was that uh, you alluded to a panic attack in Australia that you didn't go into detail to in the first book? Was that tied into that? Um, I'm not entirely sure what that story was. Uh I realized I was having um, panic attacks kind of as far back as like 2000 or so just because I wasn't dealing with with shit. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's probably related. There was I was really unhappy. I didn't want to be there. And I was like trying to force myself into sorry about that. Force myself into going and, and, you know, and being a part of it. But I just really didn't want to. Yeah, because you were newly married and you were struggling to uh, be with your wife. And I'm sure once you heard about the pregnancy, that just adds a, a whole other layer on top of this. So, I mean, more just more difficulty. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. It's, it's way harder once you start having kids. Oh, yeah. So, what's the status on the new record? What new record? New Get Up Kids record? <laughs> there isn't a new re- Get Up Kids record. We're just... We're not working on a new record? Not currently, no. Um, no, no. uh, we're just kind of taking some time off right now. Uh, I'm doing the book stuff for a while and then we're going to do the something at home about, uh, tour starting in, I think in, I'm not sure when it starts. It starts in the, in the summer, summer, fall, something like that. You hear that beeping? Yes. That's my insulin pump. Oh, that's the actual pump. Yeah. It's telling me I need to change it. So okay, I should probably wrap this up or it's going to keep beeping. All right. Uh, I'm going to, I have one very important question Okay. that I need to ask you and we, we will end with that question. Great. All right. Have you warmed up to Jim's idea of covering taking care of business? No. <laughs> <laughs> and any additional commentary on that or are we going with a firm no? I, it's, I don't know if I could ever, I can't, it, that got so stupid <laughs> for a while <laughs> that it was just like, you know, I came to a head at a show in, in St. Louis where we had been drinking all day and he just kept playing, taking care of business on stage <laughs> to the point where like, I think the crowd was like, what the fuck is going on? And we got in a big fight about it. And it's just kind of like, I don't even like, I don't know, man, they come up, they go, the guys go out drinking and they'll come up with like a, a really crazy idea like that. Like one time they're like, we're going to cover sabotage by the Beastie Boys. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> like you can do it without me if you want, but you know, so no, I have not warmed up to take, I don't even think I really have ever liked the song <laughs> taking care of business anyway. So it's just, you know, I, it's, it, yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah. It, it's a silly idea, but when I saw you guys bantering about it on stage at Furnace Fest a couple years ago, I, I have to admit, I, I kind of got into the idea of it. So you know what? We're going to leave it at no. Okay. That's fine with me. Everybody make sure you pick up the book. Yeah. Red Letter Days. It's out via Washed Up Books mm-hmm. on January 23rd. So we have to pick that up, right, Matt? Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, Matt, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you very much for having me. And there you have it. Matt Pryor. Excellent, excellent conversation. Very happy to have Matt back on the show. Check out his book. It was really interesting. I mean, there was a lot about Matt I didn't know. The whole discussion about him being diagnosed with diabetes at a young age. That one hits close to home because my older brother went through the same thing and it made me think about all of that again. And, and, you know, it was just good to get more history about the Get Up Kids and Everything else Matt is up to, so 
Great stuff. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Matt, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? Now, when we last checked in, I had COVID and I was feeling really, really bad. And I'm mostly over it now. You know, uh, our country's medical system is horrible and expensive and predatory and all of that stuff. But some things are good. You know, I woke up last Thursday and right away I knew I had COVID again. Because once you've had it, you can just feel it. So within half an hour, I could get on a Zoom doctor appointment with my doctor. Within an hour, they got me Paxlovid, that prescription that they give you uh, when you get COVID. So I started taking that. And then a day later, I was able to get up and start working on things again, which was uh, the most important thing to me because I don't like to sit around and this show has to go up every week. So this round of COVID wasn't as bad as the first time, but still bad. I still don't feel great. I still don't feel great. I'm tired. I have a headache a lot. I, you know, I don't know what's going on. I feel like I have a cold when I wake up still. It's, it's still lingering a bit, but I'm, I'm hoping to get better, but but uh, my quarantine period just ended this past Friday, so I guess it's going to take a little bit more time to feel 100%, so I'm getting there. But this past weekend, I saw All Else Failed at St. Vitus. Now, you know, I was, going, I was getting ready to go to the show. It was like 60 degrees during the day, and then by the time I went to the show, it was freezing outside. So I'm like, oh, it's cold. I'm tired. I don't feel good. I don't want to go. And then I got to the show and was talking to some of the guys before the set. And I'm like, okay, I'm 41 years old. I'm not going to like go crazy during the show. I'm too old for that. It's not going to happen, right? I'm just going to stand there and watch the show and film the first two songs as I often do for the new scene account when I go to a gig. And All Else Failed just does something to me. I it was I was like, I was possessed. Now, I didn't go crazy. I wasn't like moshing and spin kicking and all this stuff, but I was singing along a bit and head banging and I, I was just really into it, really into it. Those guys still put on one of the best live performances out there. And it was so much fun. And then after the gig, I got to catch up with everybody, the whole band. And, and you, you know how it is when you see really old friends and and you just get to hang out and catch up on everything that you haven't seen in a long time. And I was so happy. I went home so happy. I was in such a great mood and I was really glad that I went to the gig. And the set was amazing. All the songs they picked for the set, amazing. They closed with In Time, which I didn't expect. And uh, I, I just can't say enough good things. So really glad I went to that gig. And besides that, I've just been inside uh, working on the show. And that's pretty much it. We're doing a lot of recording right now. We're in a recording cycle for the show. So there's a lot of big episodes coming up. It's, uh, it's going to be good. So why don't we check in with the new scene community hour. Now, first I have some new reviews, some Apple podcast reviews, which we need more of, by the way. So here we go. All right. First new review is from Rye Bunel. Fantastic. Five stars. This is by far my favorite podcast to listen to. Each week, I'm excited to hear what Keith and his guests have in store. I appreciate that the conversations are real and down-to-earth-ish. The Code 7 episode took an amazing turn, which is another reason I love this podcast. Can't wait for more. Thank you, Rybunal, for that review. And yeah, that that Code 7 episode you know, when we took that left turn and started talking about all the ghost and UFO stuff, I loved that. And that was one of my favorite episodes of last year by far. Here's another new review from JS in Arizona. First to listen and I'm hooked. Five stars. Check it out if you're reading this. Thank you, JS. And finally, Landshark801 says, awesome podcast. Five stars. Love the guests and everything else. Keith does a great job talking with his guests. Thank you, Land Shark. So listen, we need to get to 200 reviews on Apple Podcasts, and then I'm going to let it go for a bit. But we have to get there. We're at 175. So I know a lot of people listen on Apple Podcasts. I know most people listen on Apple Podcasts. So 
open up the podcast app on your phone, search the news scene, scroll down, hit that five-star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it in this section of the show. And look, I, I would like some more support from everybody. I'm not asking for a lot. I'm not asking for a lot. Let's look. I look at how many other reviews the other shows have. Now, this is a newer show, but I would like to see some more support from everybody. We have to show everybody that we're the best. We have to show everybody that we mean business. Look at this. I'm going to, all right. So in the bottom of the podcast section, all my contemporaries are down there. It says you might also like, let's look at some of these shows. Hard Lore, Stories from Tour, 237 Apple Podcast Reviews. Axe to Grind Podcast, 658 Apple Podcast Reviews. Turned Out a Punk, 953 Apple Podcast Reviews. Krista Makes a Podcast, 742 Apple Podcast Reviews. One Life, One Chance with Toby Morse. 825 Apple Podcast Reviews. Come on. Come on. We've got to get it. We've got to get to that level. We have to do it. We're doing good on Spotify. Everyone has submitted a review there. We're like close to 230 now. So go to Apple Podcasts, hit the five-star button, and write a review. It'll help me. It'll help us in the podcast rankings. And I appreciate everybody who has submitted a review. So let's do this. Come on. We got some Spotify Q&A feedback as well for the Brad Wallace episode three days ago. Exotic layups left a heart emoji. And you know what that means. That means exotic layups liked the Brad Wallace episode. That was a great one. Thank you, exotic layups. And Andrew wrote me about the Thursday episode. Andrew says, wow, that Thursday episode was crazy. I don't know how I missed Ink and Dagger in the early 2000s but I paused the pod and took a listen. I immediately wanted to start a band for the first time in 15 years. So, so good. Thank you. The whole interview was wild. And Andrew also asked about the artist who did the artwork for the United Nations record. That artist's name was James Cauty, C-A-U-T-Y, and he was in a band called The KLF. Look them up. Some really interesting stories associated with that band. So that's it. That's all I've got for this week. Uh, Things are going great here. I'm still working on my new band. We're still in the studio working on things. Uh, That's coming. That's coming. The podcast is rolling along strong. We've got some more blockbuster interviews coming up for you. Next month is shaping up to look real, real good. Same as this month. So thank you, everybody, for your continued support. All right, so my music recommendation for this week. Did you see that Hammock and Yellow Card have announced a collaboration album? Now, this is something I never expected, and they dropped the first single, which is a reimagining of Ocean Avenue by Yellow Card. And I was sitting there listening to this on Friday on the verge of tears. It's so good. And I'm really looking forward to this record. I mean, Hammock is probably my favorite band ever at this point. Um, well, you know what? I have a lot of favorite bands. I've got a favorite heavy bands, favorite emo bands, favorite overall bands, and Hammock is up there. Hammock is a top three favorite band of mine, and uh, everything they do is gold. And I'm looking forward to this collaboration they're doing with Yellow Card. So I'm going to end the show with Hammock and Yellow Card, Ocean Avenue. I'll add the song to the new scene 2024. Spotify playlist. It's live. Look for it on Spotify. Follow it. Like it. I put all of the music associated with this year of the show in that playlist. It's a great one-stop shop to hear everything. I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks everybody for listening and until next time.